They met in a cafe. 18-year-old Rosa worked as a waitress while studying. She was training to be a pastry chef, and Pedro already worked as an architect in a small company and often stopped by for a cup of coffee at the cafe near his workplace. These two hearts seemed to be made for each other. They didn't even need to speak to each other. Just being in the same room brought joy to both of them. Two weeks after their first meeting, the young couple started dating, and three months later, they got married. People said their marriage was definitely made in heaven. They lived in a small apartment provided by Pedro's company. It happened that neither of them had any relatives. There was no one closer or dearer to Rosa and Pedro than each other. The newlyweds decided that once they had a good house, which Pedro had always dreamed of, they would start thinking about a baby. I want a big family, Pedro would say. Pedro, don't scare me. I hope you don't want seven children. Rosa would reply. And are you against it? Her husband would ask, kissing her. I think I won't cope. I won't have enough strength, and I'll crumble like a lump of sugar. Don't worry, Rosita, I won't let you crumble. So get ready to become a mother of many children. Three years passed in happy married life. Pedro had become the chief architect of the company, which had expanded significantly by that time, while Rosa baked pastries to order at home. The spouses were waiting for their new cozy home to be built. Pedro carefully thought out every detail when creating the project. He even made a three-dimensional model of their future nest. Rosa and Pedro celebrated their fourth anniversary already in the house of their dreams. The only thing left was to have children so that their laughter would fill all the rooms of the spacious Gonzalez family home. Rosita, do you still not feel sick in the mornings? Pedro would ask his beautiful wife. Not yet, she would playfully reply. By the way, not all women get sick. I read that if pregnancy is desired, and from both spouses, then a woman usually doesn't feel any discomfort. That's it. Then you'll notice you're carrying the baby only when he's ready to come out, Pedro would say cheerfully, showering Rosa's hands with kisses. You're quite a character. Rosa would laugh, pushing her husband away jokingly. Another year passed, but the long-awaited pregnancy did not occur. Pedro, do you think there's something wrong with me? Why am I still not pregnant? Rosa asked. Rosita, my darling, don't worry. We just really want a baby, and it's not happening. We need to learn to let go. Trust me, I want a child, or rather children, just as much, if not more, than you do. They will come. They must come. Because I love you so much, my girl with the hair the color of the night. I love you too, heart stealer of dark-haired girls, Rose smiled in response. And here's the fibber. I stole only one and loved only one brunette. Even if you had transparent hair, I would still fall madly in love with you. His voice carried such warmth and tenderness that Rose felt calm and lighthearted. You have a uterine bend, Sonora Gonzalez, the doctor said slowly. The chance of pregnancy is 1% out of 100. And what? Rose began with a trembling voice, nothing can be done? Unfortunately, no, I'm very sorry. Rose returned home and collapsed onto the bed, burying her face in the pillow. Why? Why did this have to happen to me? Why did this happen to us? The woman cried, pounding her fists on the pillow. And Pedro? Is his dream of a large family not meant to come true? No, she can't allow this. Rose decided to have a serious conversation with her husband. She prepared dinner and opened a bottle of good red wine. My joy, do we have some event today? Pedro asked as he entered the house. It smells as if Christmas has come. No, I just wanted to make you happy, Rose replied. During dinner, Rose could hardly eat. Everything was slipping from her hands. What's wrong, my little bird? Pedro asked worriedly. Are you feeling unwell? No, we just need to talk. Did something happen? Tell me, we're a family. Pedro, it's better for us to part ways. What? Did I offend you somehow? You must be upset that I spend too much time at work. 
No, my dear, Rose replied, placing her hand on her husband's, I just. I have no right to deprive you of the joy of becoming a father. Rosita, listen. No, Pedro, listen to me first. I went to the doctor. I can't have children. One percent out of a hundred. Wait, it's not definite yet. It is definite, Rose wiped a tear from her cheek. So you need to find another woman who can give you children. Rose, I don't need another woman. I need you. He squeezed her hand. But I won't be able to give you babies. This house will be empty, understand, and all your dreams will turn to dust. Rose, please calm down. You're all I have. You're my heart. Do you understand? Even if I never become a father, I'll be with you. We'll fight. We'll go to the capital, even to the ends of the earth. Pedro. Rosa could no longer hold back her tears. They poured out of her grayish-green eyes like a torrent. For several years, the couple had not given up hope of becoming parents. Pedro took Rosa to the best doctors in the country and even abroad, but all in vain. Everyone said the same thing. The chances of getting pregnant were close to zero. Pedro, darling, Rosa began one day as she walked with her husband along the beach. What if we adopt or foster a child? Then, Rosa, my little bird, I'm not ready to raise someone else's child. I'm sorry, but I understand you. I'm scared too. I've heard all sorts of stories about how children can be different, sick, with bad genes that aren't immediately recognizable. And then adoptive parents suffer for the rest of their lives and, as terrible as it sounds, regret their decision. Exactly, they regret it. Imagine, we take a baby and then realize that they're nothing like us, neither physically nor internally. What do we do then? Yes, you're right. But you know, sometimes I feel so lonely. My cookies and cakes no longer suffice. The house is big and so empty. Rosita, my darling, please don't cry. Let's organize some kind of club for kids right here at our house. And you can take care of them. How about that idea? Pedro, I'm just a pastry chef. What kids? What can I do with them? Think about it. If needed, you can get another education in education. And those children who will fall into your caring, gentle hands will be happy. Pedro, how do you manage to make me happy so easily? You instill faith in myself. It's so important. I would have died without you long ago, my golden architect of human destinies. Wow, you're giving me quite the title. You're just a poet. Oh, stop it. What poet am I? I'm just. She didn't finish her sentence because a little boy in a green cap crashed right into them. Alejandro, be careful, said the boy's mother, a graceful woman in a bright swimsuit. Sorry for my little rascal. It's okay, everything's fine, replied Rosa. That night, Rosa couldn't fall asleep. She was thinking about her husband's words. What if she really taught the kids something? Then the house wouldn't be so empty and cold. But what to teach? Rosa used to love embroidery and crochet. Yes, she could spend hours crafting. School friends were amazed by her diligence and precision. It's decided she would teach the children embroidery and crochet. She just needed to remember everything and practice a little. After this thought, the young woman immediately fell asleep. I'm going to teach the children, Pedro, Rosa said with a smile at breakfast. That's great, my little bird. What will you teach them? How to become as sweet as you. Pedro. I'm serious. You're always joking. Remember, I used to embroider and crochet before, and then somehow I stopped. I remember, you still haven't finished my portrait, shameless one, he winked at his wife. I'll finish it, my dear, I promise. So, I'm planning to teach these kids. Do you think I'll succeed? Of course. All the children in the neighborhood will come running. The house will buzz like a beehive. May the Lord hear your words. Rosa said dreamily, pressing her hands to her chest. Rosa Gonzalez had changed beyond recognition. 
She embarked on a vigorous self-education campaign, recalling all the things her old grandmother had taught her in childhood. She began buying books and magazines with craft patterns and expert advice. Before long, Rosa had her first pupils. They eagerly came two or three times a week to learn handicrafts with their kind and sensitive teacher. The house really buzzed, just as Pedro had promised. Rosa was happy. She was needed by these girls. She knew how to delight them and surprise them. The woman, so lonely and distressed about not being able to become a mother, blossomed, became more beautiful, as if she were 18 again and had just met her Pedro. Several years passed. Rosa somehow unnoticed turned 30. It happened the day after her birthday. Rosa was waiting for her husband to come home from work as usual. Her students had already left. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Strange, thought Rosa, Pedro always opens the door himself. Pedrito, is that you? The woman called through the door. It's me, my little bird, open up quickly. What's wrong, dear? Rosa stared at the bundle her husband held in one hand, while clutching his precious black leather briefcase in the other. Rosita, I. Pedro, is this a doll? Where did you get it? Why? You see, my little bird. And then suddenly the bundle began to move and squeak. Automatically, Rosa took the squeaking bundle from her husband. Pedro, it's a baby. Whose is it? I don't know, my joy, he replied calmly. I found her by the roadside, lying in a rickety basket, right under a bush. I couldn't just walk past. Oh my God. This is a heaven-sent gift. Pedro, why did you say she was lying? Look at this little face. It's clearly a girl. She even looks like you. Yes, such a lovely face, Rosa said tenderly, gazing at the baby's face. She's my girl, my daughter, I won't give her to anyone. So Pedro and his beloved wife became parents. Monica grew up to be a lovely girl. Everyone around said she resembled Rosa a lot. No one even suspected they weren't blood-related. Mama, do you love me? Little Monica asked as Rosa tucked her into bed. Of course, I love you, my little flower. More than anything in the world. And what about Dad? And Dad? I don't have anyone dearer and closer to me than you two. Sleep, my little one. Will you teach me to knit and embroider like you teach the girls who come to our house? The girl continued, holding her mother's hand. I will, my sunshine, I will definitely teach you. But for now, close your eyes. Are we going to the sea tomorrow? The daughter asked again. Monica, it's already late, you need to sleep. But yes, tomorrow we will definitely go to the sea, Rose said, kissing her on the cheek tenderly. Monica was a curious and kind girl. She dreamed of becoming a teacher for elementary school children. She always had many friends. The house was constantly filled with cheerful children's voices, and Rose never felt lonely or unneeded for a moment. Pedro was delighted. He adored his daughter and spent all his free time with her and his wife. It was a real, friendly, and happy family. Pedro's dream of a large family did not come true, but he had the hearts of his beloved girls. Monica did not abandon her childhood dream of becoming a teacher and entered a pedagogical college. She was the best student in her class. Everything came easy to her, and ideas poured out of this energetic girl like lava from a volcano. Monica graduated from college with honors and immediately started working at a school. Sweetie, why do you want to go to a regular school? Pedro asked one day. Dad, what do you mean by regular school? I could arrange for you to go to a private, elite one. But I don't want anyone to arrange anything for me, Daddy. I want to achieve everything on my own. And besides, I want to work with children from ordinary families. Monica, I have nothing against ordinary, as you say, people, but you're such a great specialist. You deserve more. No, Dad. I want these kids from poor families to become smart, believe in themselves, and achieve a lot in their lives. All right, my butterfly, I understand. 
you're a teacher sent from above. Soon after starting her job, Monica met a guy she fell head over heels in love with. His name was Antonio. He was handsome and always joking. The girl couldn't spend a day without him. They walked along the seashore and talked about books, different parts of the world they wanted to visit. They were very young, and life stretched out before them like a long road to the horizon. Monica, honey, Rose started a conversation with her daughter one day. You should be careful with your boyfriend, with Antonio. Mom, what's wrong? I love him. Is that bad? No, sweetheart, it's not bad. I just worry about you very much. I feel like you take your relationship too seriously while he seems somewhat frivolous. Mom, Antonio is really nice. I believe you, my little flower, but I just don't want you to get hurt. Mommy, everything will be fine. Don't worry, she kissed her mother on the cheek and dashed off to her date again. Rose's fears were confirmed. Perhaps Antonio was a decent guy, but he clearly hadn't learned to take responsibility, and his love turned out to be just words. The school children began their summer vacation, and Monica only worked a few hours a day. The rest of the time, she spent at her boyfriend's studio. Antonio called himself an artist, but it seemed he hadn't created anything worthwhile yet. One day, returning from her friend's place, Rose found Monica in the living room. She seemed upset about something. Monica, my girl. Rose began and paused. The woman's gaze fell on the coffee table in front of the couch where her daughter sat. There lay a pregnancy test. A red cross spoke volumes without words. Mom, don't worry, please. Monica started nervously, clutching a book in her hands. Have you told Antonio yet? Rose asked calmly. Not yet. Then go ahead, text him and send a photo of the test. Do you think that's the right way to do it, rather than telling him in person? Yes, I think so. Men, you know. They need some preparation to grasp the situation. Mommy, I thought you'd be beside yourself with this news, but you're smiling. You're the best mom in the world. Why should I be beside myself? It's time for me to become a grandmother, otherwise, I won't have the strength for grandchildren later. I'll become too old. She sat down beside Monica and hugged her, stroking her daughter's hair. Mom, you'll be the youngest and most beautiful grandmother in all of Spain, placing her head on her mother's shoulder, Monica said. Let's just send Antonio the photo already, Rose said with childish excitement. Do you think he'll be happy? The girl pondered. I think so, yes. He's an artist, sensitive by nature. There was no response from the future father. He hadn't been online since morning. Mom, I'm worried. Maybe it's better to go to his studio and talk. Okay, darling, just be careful, Rose hugged her daughter. Okay, I'll be back soon. Stay in touch. Monica nodded, slipped her phone into the pocket of her light beige trousers, and dashed out of the house. The girl returned half an hour later. So, did you talk? Rose greeted Monica, standing by the flower bed right next to the house. No. His studio is closed, and the person who sells books in the same building said he packed up and left around 9 in the morning. Did he say anything about a trip? No, he didn't say anything at all. Call him. Everything will become clear. I called, Mom, but he's not answering. He simply ran away. Who knows what made him leave? Mom, if he loves, he would say he's forced to leave. Tears welled up in the girl's eyes. Don't cry, my dear. Let's wait. You know, life brings all sorts of things. Mom, the bookshop owner told me he seems to owe a lot to the landlord. He definitely ran away. And I, foolishly, believed him, believed in his love. You were right, Mom, to warn me to be more careful with Antonio. Why didn't I listen to you then, Mom? Why? Feelings, darling, feelings. Don't get upset. It's bad for you and the little one too. Let's go drink some tea instead. I made Turin. 
You love it, don't you, my sweet tooth? Let's go. Mom, did you tell Dad? I'm sorry, sweetie, I couldn't hold it and I told him everything. And? What did he say? Is he going to scold me? You're in for a surprise. He's planning to buy you a car for the baby's birth. Oh, I've ruined the surprise again, Rosa said, covering her mouth with her hand. I need to be punished. Your dad and I are depriving you of Turin, Monica chuckled. Oh no. Not that. Rose burst into laughter. Laura was born a little early, but both mother and daughter felt fine, and they were quickly discharged home. Pedro and Rosa prepared well for their daughter's arrival. The baby's room was already set up. The parents thought of everything down to the smallest detail, from wallpaper to pacifiers. Our granddaughter will have everything a little princess could dream of, Pedro said to his wife as they drove to pick up their girls from the maternity hospital. Father also took care of a separate room and other conveniences for his daughter and granddaughter in advance. All the love he planned to give to his large family, he now poured onto his three beloved women, his wife, daughter, and granddaughter Laura. Laura grew up as a mischievous tomboy, unlike Monica, who was interested in books, pencils, drawing albums, and modeling clay from an early age. Laura always wanted to be on the move. You should have been born a boy, Monica laughed. Not everyone in the family should be into drawing and crafting, Pedro said, lifting his granddaughter in his arms. Don't offend my little fighter. Dad, you should teach her how to shoot, so she'll definitely become a fighter. And I will. Do you doubt me? I will teach her. No, Daddy, I don't doubt you, of all people. No way. No shooting. Rosa intervened in the conversation. I will teach Laura how to bake cookies and make turin. You two will end up fighting, Grandpa and Grandma, Monica laughed. Looks like you'll have to have another grandson so you can share. I knew it. I always knew that my daughter was the most sensible in the world. Look at her. She's a real thinker. Pedro's dreams came true, albeit many years after they first arose in his mind, but they did come true. None of their acquaintances could believe that they almost never argued or quarreled. Their home was a gathering place where joy, happiness, and genuine love reigned. It seemed like a fairy tale world where only fairies, gnomes, and elves lived. But trouble knocked on the door of this fairy tale world. When Lorita turned five, Pedro fell ill. Doctors diagnosed him with stage four brain cancer. Beloved husband, father, and grandfather literally burned out within a few months. Rosa thought she wouldn't survive this loss. It was so heavy for her to bear. Her love hadn't diminished since they met in that cafe 38 years ago. And now he had left them. No one would ever call Rosa a little bird again, or Monica a butterfly. No one would play with mischievous Lorita or teach her how to shoot. No one would create some fantastic building project anymore. Only memories would remain, only the warmth in the heart they invoked and the bitterness of loss. Sweetheart, I can't live in this house anymore. One evening, when Lorita was already asleep, Rosa said quietly, I think we need to sell the house and buy something smaller. Whatever you say, Mom. To be honest, it's hard for me to stay here too. Everything reminds me of Dad, of his jokes, she sniffled. You're right. We need to sell this house when it's possible. And so the mother and daughter did. They sold the large house, lovingly designed for them, and moved to a modest cottage almost right on the coast. The sea carried away sadness and instilled hope for the better. It became a little easier. The house smelled of cookies again. Students started coming to Rose's again. Monica still worked at the school. It seemed like everything was slowly getting back on track, but Rosa was yet to face another trial, a terrible trial. There were no signs of trouble. Monica and her daughter were planning to visit Isabella, Monica's best friend. She lived quite far from them, so they were going for a few days. Maybe you won't go? Helping to pack things in a small suitcase, Rosa said. Mom, we've already agreed, Isabella is waiting for us. She bought a bunch of gifts for Laura, prepared enough food for probably a hundred people. 
You will be lonely, won't you? We won't be gone for long. We'll be back in three days. Okay, darling, forgive me. I keep trying to keep you and Lorita close to me. I'm getting old. Mommy, you're not getting old at all. You're the youngest and most beautiful among us. Thank you, M.O. Rosa sometimes called her daughter that. In childhood, the girl always scolded her mom for it, but now she even liked it. Yes, mom always came up with something. She was such a character. The daughter and granddaughter did not return home. Around one in the afternoon, Rosa received a call and was told the worst news imaginable for this woman. Your daughter and granddaughter died in a car accident. Their bodies were burned beyond recognition. I'm very sorry, said the voice on the other end of the line. Rose stood there, thunderstruck, the ground slipping from beneath her feet. No, no, it couldn't be true. No, it couldn't be her girls, it must be a mistake. Monica would call any moment now, cheerfully telling her that everything was fine with Lori, that they would be together again soon. But Monica didn't call. Rose had to identify her loved one's bodies by the items that survived. Yes, those were her daughter's earrings and her granddaughter's bracelet. In that moment, life ended for Rose. She stood by the graveside for a long time, talking to herself. Why me? Why did this have to happen to me? First Pedro, my dear Pedro, with his radiant eyes, and then my babies, my lovely girls. What did I do wrong? Where did I sin? What did I do to deserve such punishment? Why should I go on living now? Why? Tears streamed down the woman's pale cheeks as she clutched her handkerchief with trembling hands, not even attempting to wipe them away. Rose had always been slender, but now she seemed entirely drained of life from grief and sorrow. Rose often visited the cemetery. Her husband's grave wasn't here. He had asked for his ashes to be scattered at sea. Rose and Monica fulfilled his last wish. But there was the grave of her daughter and little granddaughter. The woman would stand here for a long time, placing fresh flowers and crying, crying. The only thing that saved Rose was her students. Through her handicrafts, she could momentarily forget her triple sorrow. She was afraid to be alone. Thoughts overwhelmed her, and she felt like she was going crazy, like she would be torn apart by grief and memories. I'd rather be dead too, thought Rose, lying sleepless in bed. Why did I let them go? My girls would be with me now, and we'd laugh and bake cookies. Sometimes Rose couldn't close her eyes until morning. She tried to occupy herself in the small garden surrounding her house, so empty and even hostile as it seemed to Rose. But nothing worked, everything slipped from her hands. She would throw it aside, retreat to the gazebo, and spend hours looking at their family photo. Five months had passed since Monica and Lori had been laid to rest. On that day, Rose stood once again at the graves of her beloved girls. She cried again, silently sobbing. Nearby, a cemetery worker, it was obvious from his uniform, was clearing away dry flowers and slowly placing them in a black bag. Excuse me, is this your daughter? He suddenly asked Rose. Yes, my daughter, Monica, and granddaughter Lori. She looks a lot like you, he said, looking at the photo of the young woman. Same thoughtful eyes and gentle smile. Thank you, Rose sniffled slightly. Many people tell me we look alike, even though she's not blood-related to me. Foster daughter? Yes, although, you know, it's just a heaven-sent gift. They left her right under a bush in a tattered basket. Who could abandon this angel in a basket full of holes? I still can't fathom it. Well, but if I tell you what I did over 25 years ago, you won't even want to talk to me. Nobody knows about it. Only me and that person. What person? That person to whom I sold my newborn daughter. Mother of God. What made you do that? Rose asked without judgment, and the cemetery worker told the woman his story, which subsequently changed both their lives. Ricardo, the cemetery worker, was dating a simple girl named Anna Anita, as he always called her. They loved each other very much. 
Ricardo was determined to marry her. He was 19 at the time, and Anna had just turned 17. One evening, Anna, as usual, waited for her beloved on the blue bench near the old plane tree. Ricardo was working for a man who was involved in fish processing in a small workshop. Ricky, Anna started straight away, we need to talk. It's very important. What's wrong, my Barry? Ricky, I... I'm pregnant, she lowered her eyes. Anna, you, don't worry. We'll handle this together. I work. Let's move in together. I only have an old grandmother whom I can't leave. She loves you, she's just very weak. Are you serious? Of course, I'm serious, silly. My father will kill me if he finds out. No, we'll get married and raise our baby. Anna threw herself into her beloved's arms and burst into tears. He stroked her curly hair and whispered words of love to her. Anna moved in with Ricardo. Her parents stopped communicating with her, their daughter didn't meet their expectations and went down the wrong path. The guy worked and his beloved took care of the household and his sick grandmother. Soon the grandmother passed away and Ricardo and Anna were left alone. They were waiting for the baby to arrive. Anna didn't go to the clinic, she was afraid that her underage status would be revealed and Ricky would have problems with the police. In the apartment opposite where Anna and Ricardo lived, there was a woman who had worked as a midwife many years ago. She sometimes checked on the girl's condition and promised to help if anything was needed. Anna was grateful to her and offered her help in return. Labor began unexpectedly and very quickly. Ricardo ran to the neighbor. Dona Rita, please, open up. He knocked on the door opposite his apartment. Coming, coming. Was heard from behind the door, somewhere deep in the little apartment. Dona Rita, please, Anna. She's. I'll be there in a minute. I'll gather everything necessary. Go to her, my boy, go. Anita was fading before their eyes. She had expended her last strength to help her daughter come into the world while she herself was fading away. We need to call an ambulance, Rita quickly said. Hurry, go, make the call. Ricky, I love you so much, the girl whispered almost soundlessly. Ricardo rushed to her side and grabbed her hand. Anita, my sunshine, everything will be all right. I'll call the ambulance right now. I love you, she repeated, and our little girl. Her hand hung lifelessly, her gaze fixed. No. Ricardo cried, holding his beloved's hand to his face. Don't leave, don't abandon me. Rita touched his shoulder gently. She, she's no longer in this world, my boy, she said, slowly closing the girl's eyes with her hand. What was he to do? What? How could he raise the baby alone, with no one to rely on, and he needed to work? Ricardo walked with the little girl in his arms, not knowing where to go. He sat on a large rock by the roadside and sat there, perhaps for half an hour. Why so glum, buddy, a well-dressed man asked cheerfully. Anita, my girl, died, couldn't handle childbirth. Ricardo began to explain haltingly. I don't know what to do. We have no one. Listen, kid, I can help you. Give the child to me. My wife and I will be good parents to her. Why do you want someone else's child? He asked, surprised. My wife can't have children, and we've been dreaming of a baby. What can you give her? How will you feed her? I'll pay you, and no one will ever know what happened here, I promise. Ricardo glanced at his child and handed her to the man. He didn't even ask for his name, just noticed that the man's eyes were literally glowing with kindness. He took the baby with one hand and handed him a thick bundle of money with the other. Be happy, brother, the man said and quickly walked away. Ricardo stood bewildered by the roadside, then he put the money in his jacket pocket and headed in the opposite direction. He still had to bid farewell to his beloved Anita. Every day I ask forgiveness from my daughter and from her mother too. And you know nothing about her? Rosa asked sadly. Nothing, the interlocutor quietly replied. What's your name? Rosa asked. 
Ricardo. And I'm Rosa. Very nice to meet you, Dona Rosa. And to me, Don Ricardo. With that, they parted ways. At home, Rosa recalled the story of the gravedigger. Why does it happen like this? The one who could give everything to a child and wanted it more than anything, God didn't give the opportunity to be a mother, and this little one's mother was taken away right after birth. It's so unfair, Rosa thought, sitting in the gazebo in the middle of her garden, which had fallen into complete neglect. The woman couldn't find an answer. A week later, Rosa headed back to the cemetery. She was about to leave when she suddenly noticed Ricardo. Hello, Dona Rosa, he greeted her. Hello, Don Ricardo. How are you, she replied. How can a confirmed bachelor be doing, the man sadly smiled. Don Ricardo, could you tidy up my garden? I will pay you well for it. Why not help a good person? I can help. I have tomorrow off, and as you understand, no plans, except for a little laundry, he said. Oh, that's wonderful. Then, how about around 11? I'll write down the address and phone number now, she said, pulling out a notebook from her leather bag, scribbling something in it with a silver pen, quickly tearing out the sheet and handing it to her companion. He tucked the sheet into the breast pocket of his work jacket and promised not to be late. The next day, at the appointed hour, Ricardo stood outside Rosa's house. Hello, Don Ricardo. Glad to see you, she opened the door and said. Would you like some tea? Hello, Dona Rosa. Let's deal with your garden first, and then we can have tea, he smiled. You have a very beautiful house, and a lovely garden too. Thank you. We used to have a huge house. My husband designed it himself, and then, after his death, my daughter and I sold that house to get rid of painful memories and bought this little house for the two of us. But now, I'll have to live here alone, Rosa concluded sadly. Well, let's go. I'll show you where the necessary tools are kept. Two hours later, the garden was unrecognizable. You've done a great job. Thank you, Rosa almost cheerfully said. They drank tea in the gazebo, which resembled a lace tent. Do you bake these cookies yourself? Ricardo asked. I used to, my girls and I used to bake them. I haven't done it since that dreadful day, but yesterday I decided to make them to please you. After all, there is no one left to please me anymore, Rosa said sadly. Don't say that, you're not old at all. And you managed to please me, Ricardo said. Suddenly, Ricardo's gaze stopped at a simple necklace around Rosa's neck. It was a round wooden pendant adorned with carving. Something stirred in him, and his heart suddenly raced. Dona Rosa, where did you get this necklace? he asked. This, she pointed to her pendant. Yes, that. I found this pendant wrapped in swaddling clothes with my monica. There's an engraving on it. The letter A. Probably someone's name started with this letter. After the death of my girls, I started wearing it constantly, as if they were always with me. Ricardo suddenly turned pale. He remained silent and motionless. Only his large sad eyes blinked frequently. That's what people usually do when they want to hold back tears. What's wrong with you? Dona Rosa asked, alarmed. It's her. The man struggled to say. It's my daughter, your Monica. I sold her to your husband many years ago. This pendant I carved for my Anita. Ricardo covered his face with his hands and silently cried. Rosa began to sob. What did you say? Rosa suddenly remembered. My husband bought our little girl from you. Yes, he handed me a thick bundle of money. Said it was for the funeral of my Anita and even managed to set some aside for a rainy day. Ugh, I can't even bear to remember it. It makes me feel sick to my stomach. But back then, it seemed like the only way out. And Pedro told me he found our Monica under a bush in a rickety basket. It's so strange, he never lied to me. Probably didn't want to upset you, Ricardo shrugged. Yeah, 
What's the use of remembering all this now? My girl is gone anyway, or rather, my girls, my precious little ones. Rosa began wiping away tear after tear, which, like dewdrops on flower petals, rolled down her emaciated face. As she bid farewell to Ricardo, Rosa said, Don Ricardo, do come over for tea sometime. We essentially share the same grief. It seems easier to cope with it together, I think. I agree, it's easier together, the man replied, rubbing his nose with two fingers. Of course. So, shall we see each other? Until we meet again, Ricardo. It seemed to Rosa that she had found a brother she had never had. It was so easy to communicate with Ricardo, so pleasant to accept his help around the house and to delight him with delicious meals. She felt that he also enjoyed her company because he found someone who not only didn't judge him for what he had done but also shared his pain. During one lunch, Rosa and Ricardo talked about various things. You know, I sleep so poorly, Rosa complained. Sometimes I can't close my eyes until dawn. Even sleeping pills don't help, it seems to make it worse. I had that too. Didn't sleep for days, wandered around like a shadow. But a herb helped me. What? Rosa exclaimed. No, it's not what you think. I have a friend, he lives in the capital now. His father is an herbalist, lives in a cottage in the middle of the forest, treats people. There was always a crowd at his place, at least last time I was there, about ten years ago. He helped me, gave me some concoction. The insomnia went away, and my nerves calmed down a bit. Wow, living deep in the woods in this day and age. It's like something out of a fairy tale about magical gnomes, smiled Rosa. Is it far? Not really. Let's go. Maybe he's still available, Ricardo replied. Let's do it, agreed the woman. Otherwise, I'll lose my mind with this insomnia soon. One rainy Saturday morning, Ricardo picked up Rosa in his old pickup truck, and they set off to visit the forest gnome, as they jokingly called the herbalist. They drove out of town, with fields on the left and ravines and forests on the right, forests everywhere. It's picturesque here, said Rosa. Yeah, and you know, nothing really changes. It's been fields and forests for the past 20 years, Ricardo remarked, making a right turn. We're almost there. They arrived at an old house with a slightly crooked porch. Look, it's still standing. But there's no one around. The old man must have passed away. Ricardo speculated. What a pity, Rosa sighed. But the door of the cottage creaked open and a girl of six or seven appeared on the porch. She had short curly hair, joyfully sticking out in all directions. Are you here to see Grandpa? She asked briskly. Yes, darling, Rosa replied. Are you his granddaughter, then? What's your name? Laura, but Grandpa calls me Lolo. Oh my goodness. She looks just like my Lorita. Rosa whispered to Ricardo. But she's nothing like my friend, nor his wife, he mused. Don Juan, is that you? Ricardo exclaimed, hugging the old man. Ricky, is that you, my boy? The old man squinted. Yes. It's me, Don Juan. And this is Rosa, he gestured to the woman standing beside him. Hello, she greeted. Hello. Come in. How can I help you? Don Juan asked. Don Juan, you used to have a miraculous elixir for insomnia. Do you have it now? Ricardo grinned broadly. I have everything. Where's Lolo? Where did this little rascal go again? I told her to bring water. Oh, what a restless child, Don Juan said. Is she your granddaughter? Asked Rosa. You could say that. I found her. She fell from the sky, it seemed. I could hardly manage. She was just starting to come to herself covered in bruises, had to cut her hair short like a boy, wore a bandage for a month and a half, poor thing. Why didn't you report it to the police? Rosa wondered. They must be looking for her. She was weak, I didn't want to traumatize her further. I got attached to her, like my own. 
The door swung open, and Laura burst in with a pitcher of water. Granny? The girl suddenly exclaimed, nearly dropping the jug from her hands. Rosa turned to the girl and covered her mouth with her hand. Lorita? My girl, is it really you? It's me. Why haven't you come for so long? And where is mom? Tears welled up in her eyes as Rosa hugged the little one close. Virgin Mary. You're, she didn't finish her sentence. Ricardo and Don Juan watched silently as if struck dumb. It couldn't be, Lorita alive, alive. But then who was the girl with her bracelet on her wrist? The three of them returned home together. Lorita chatted along the way, telling her grandmother everything she could remember. We were driving with mom along the road and suddenly we noticed a girl, she was probably about six, like me. Mom stopped and asked her why she was all alone here. She was crying and saying she wouldn't live with that mean aunt anymore. We put her in our car. I gave her my favorite bracelet made of stone beads, the one my grandpa gave me. And then the car hit something and I flew down somewhere. And then I only remember a kind forest grandfather who smeared me with some ointments and gave me different bitter decoctions. I think that's what he called them. And then you arrived. My dear Lord, my little one, I thought you were already dead, Rosa said quietly. And Mom. Mom died, right? Laura asked somewhat maturely. Rosa nodded. She didn't want to lie to her granddaughter, but she couldn't find the strength to talk about Monica's death. And who is this man driving? Lorita asked. This, little one, this is your grandfather. How? My grandfather Pedro is already dead. That's right, my joy, but this is another one of your grandfathers, Grandfather Ricardo. Lorita didn't ask anything else, dozing off on Granny's shoulder. Rosa and Ricardo didn't speak either. They knew for sure that a completely different life had begun, now they had a reason to live. How fortunate it was that Ricardo approached Rosa at the cemetery and started that difficult conversation. If not for that conversation, perhaps they would have never found their Lorita, their one granddaughter for both, their precious heart. Dear viewers, If you enjoyed the story, please support the video by liking it and leaving a comment. Thank you very much.